quest for gold. This is a film of the Australian lightweight Coxless 4. It commences with the rowing of the Penrith Cup, the Australian lightweight Cox 4's championship, which was rowed on the Olympic course at Lake Wendery, Ballarat, during Easter 1974. Here we see the start of Victoria's heat. By the halfway mark, the race was over. And with only the winner going forward to the final, the other crews eased off and Victoria, displaying one of the main attributes of a champion crew, raced on unconcerned to win by 17 lengths from the Tasmanian crew in second place and New South Wales third. Next day in the final, with their old rival South Australia, the winners of the other heat, providing the main opposition, they were never headed and went on to win by two lengths, a decisive margin for a national championship event. South Australia was second, Queensland third, and Western Australia fourth. The Penrith Cup, won the previous year by Victoria, with three of the present members in the crew, was presented to Campbell Johnson by His Excellency, the Governor of Victoria, Sir Henry Winnicky. Days later, the Australian selectors Jim Howden, Joe Saunders, and Morris Grace had little trouble in naming the crew and their coach Peter Philp as the Australian lightweight Coxless Four for the World Championships at Lucerne. I joined the lightweight Coxless Four on the 23rd of August, 12 days before the championship. They were staying at the Gastoff Jager at Freezewell, out in the Swiss countryside, about 15 kilometres from Bern. Training commenced early each morning with a cross-country run, followed by exercises. breakfast they piled into the blend and set off for their training headquarters. The club was situated about two or three kilometres from Bern on a river which ran down into a lake and provided perfect conditions for training. outing with a long spell of slow paddling to warm up. The crew which had commenced its training back in July the previous year with several months of gym work had been rowing at this stage for about nine months and had rowed the best part of 2,500 miles together. After the first mile or so, the pressure commenced to increase. And here you see the crew rowing with beautiful rhythm at a good firm to full pressure. The boat they are rowing in is the Alec McLeish. It was built specially for the crew by Jeff Sykes of Geelong and was alleged to weigh about 52 kilograms.
Returning to the Burn Rowing Club after the morning row, the crew was met by Howard Croker, the well-known oar maker, who was the official boatman for the team, and other members of the Australian team, Paul Herxot, the interpreter, and George Petlin, the sculler. Today, the team travelled to the Agassi for two days rowing with members of the Swiss national team. Jeff Reese and Ag Mitchamore seemed anxious not to give away their table tennis form. Four Australian scholars, George Petlin, Ted Hale, Paul Rowe and Dick Riddell, borrowed a coxless quad skull and went for a row against the Swiss national quad scholars. For the men's event, the quad skull is a coxless boat. For the women's, it is coxed. It was arranged that the two crews would row approximately 2,000 metres together under pressure. The Swiss quad scholars eventually came fourth in the grand final of their event. The Australians broke at the start and opened up an early lead of about half to three quarters of a length. They were still about that distance ahead of the Swiss crew when the latter stopped at the thousand metre mark. For what reason, we were not quite clear. I spent one day on the Rotsey at Lucerne to see what the course was like and saw the special catamaran which is used for televising the races and then returned again to Freezewell for the final training of the Australian Coxless Four, both heavyweight and lightweight. saw a little of the Australian coxless pair and later saw the eight for the first time. On most days the water was like a sheet of glass except for a few fishermen and boats which for the most part travelled slowly there was very little wash from other people using the river. Herzog, the interpreter, was also a very good scholar and had been national champion of Holland. Petlin, the Australian scholar, was rowing under pressure here with the lightweight coxless four giving him plenty of pace. Coxless boats are normally steered either by the bowman or the stroke. In the case of the Australian lightweights, Cam Johnson the stroke steered the boat.
Peter felt the coach was always on the job, producing staminade at the end of the outward row, recording the pulse rates of the crew, and generally encouraging the crew at all times in their work. This crew, which had already won the lightweight Cox Fours Championship of New South Wales and Victoria, as well as winning the Australian title, had been together for a great period of time. Three of them, as mentioned earlier, having rode in the winning Penrith Cup crew the previous year, as well as winning both the New South Wales and Victorian Championships. afternoon row there was a mix-up about who was to drive them to the boat shed. So the crew set out to try their luck at hitchhiking over the six or seven kilometres. Finally arrived at the shed, but to say the least they were a little irritable. Australian aid. George Petland did a final trial of about 2,000 metres and was rowing under pressure here at about 32 strokes a minute. That afternoon, it was arranged that the heavyweight Coxless 4 and the lightweight Coxless 4 would train together under pressure, the intention being to do a total of 16 bursts of 30 strokes with one minute intervals between bursts. of the lightweight Coxless 4 and the coach were members of the Melbourne University Boat Club. Bill McGuinness, number three of the heavyweights, was also from Melbourne University Boat Club. The other three were from Western Australia, although George Zuris in the bow seat formally rode for many years in Victoria. His many victories included rowing in a winning Penrith Cup crew as well as a winning West Australian Kings Cup 8. All these shots are of the crews rowing under full pressure. In fact, the rate was round about 36, 37 or 38 strokes a minute.
team manager, Ian McDonald, came out in the other speedboat, which was driven by Lockie Payne. The heavyweight four had had some sickness recently, and prior to completing the first eight bursts of 30 strokes, Joe Saunders announced that the crew would not be doing the final eight bursts on the way back. At the break, more staminade was consumed by the crew. On the return journey, the lightweights continued with their training program and completed their 16 bursts of 30 strokes. The next day, I travelled a day ahead of the crew to Lucerne and took these shots from the train on the way. The heats of the lightweight coxless fours were rode on the second day. In the first heat, Holland and USA were the main contenders. In the early stages, the United States led Holland and it looked as though they would take off the heat. But a tremendous spurt by the Dutch crew gave them victory by the very small margin of one tenth of a second. The time of the Scardi crew from Holland was six minutes, 40.12 seconds. USA were only a few seconds a few inches behind with Sweden third, West Germany fourth, followed by Norway fifth and Turkey sixth. In the second heat seen on the coloured television, Australia was on the far station, number six, and took an early lead and came down well ahead of the other crews to win by the large margin of over 10 seconds from Denmark. Their time, which was slightly faster than the first heat, was six minutes 39.12 seconds. Mark came in over three lengths behind them, with Great Britain fourth, Mexico fifth, and Italian Italy had scratched. Conditions on this day were almost perfect, there being virtually no wind at all. In the first repertoire, USA came in ahead of Norway, their time being 6 minutes 36.58 seconds. The 
first and second crews went to the grand final with the winners of the two heats. In the second rapid charge, West Germany came in a clear winner ahead of Sweden in the time of 6 minutes 38.48 seconds. All other crews went into the little final. Sunday the 8th of September 1974, the day of the little finals and the grand finals. At the departure staging, the Australian manager Ian McDonald saw the crews off. The various officials of FISA kept an eye on the crews to see that everything was in order. Australia had drawn number one station nearest the camera. Conditions were good, but there was a slight cross breeze from the other bank, which meant that Australia was in the less favourable station, on the opposite side of the course from their heat. At the 500 metre mark, Australia was leading by one second. At the 1,000 metres, Australia had gone to a lead of over two seconds. And coming through the 1,500 metres, they were 4.3 seconds ahead of the others. And rowing brilliantly, they went through the finish, 5.14 seconds ahead of the second crew, which was Holland. This margin of 5.14 seconds was the second largest winning margin of all the grand finals. Their winning time, 6 minutes 38.12 seconds, with Holland 6 minutes 43.36 seconds, second, USA third, West Germany fourth, Sweden fifth and Norway sixth. Gave Australia its first gold medal win in a world championship. It was also the first award of gold medals for the day. The medals were presented by the president of FISA, Tommy Keller. Campbell Johnson Andrew Mitchell Jeffrey Reese Colin Smith Then the large bronze gilt medal awarded to the club of the winners was presented to the coach, Peter Philp. We don't know what Peter Philp said to Tommy Keller. Only the gold medal winners were out of their boat for the presentation. The silver and bronze medal winners are presented with their medals in their boat. Second place and silver medal winners, Scardi of Holland. Third place and bronze medal winners, United States of America. <laughs> 